So I just showed you the kind of, of border defense that, that colonies have, you know, protecting their, their colony from intruders and invaders. They also have what I call a colony national defense. This is, this is a launching of a full-scale defensive posture with stinging and bees coming out of the nest and, and, uh, and whatnot. So if you look at the pictures here, um, here's a horse that was killed by uh, a colony of Africanized bees in Mexico. Horses tend to be quite sensitive to the venom of honeybees, but the other problem is, is that often uh, farmers or, or local villagers will, will tether their horses uh, close to beehives, and once the bees uh, get bothered, disturbed by them, then they'll start stinging, and then it gets a, a, a growing uh, response that can kill a horse. And here's a beekeeper who was working uh, a hive of Africanized bees, not wearing gloves, um, and you can pay for it because each of these little dots is a stinger that was left behind by a, um, a bee, an Africanized bee that, that stung this individual. And this is a beekeeper uh, who's out uh, trying to manage a, an Africanized honeybee colony. They're very, very defensive. Uh, they're all over this individual. Uh, fortunately, they have a, a suit on, a bee suit and a veil, and, and they didn't uh, get stung. Honeybees defend their nest against intruders and, and predators, um, and they only defend the nest. They're not aggressive. You hear people talk about, oh, how aggressive some bees are or whatever, but aggression implies that, 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 that they've got something against you, and they don't. They simply defend their nest. In fact, a swarm of honeybees hanging in a tree isn't defensive, but an, an established colony inside of a hive, like what we have here, will defend that hive and its resources. The stimuli that they respond to, which is why I say it's defensive behavior, because they're simply responding to stimuli that we might present to them, are, uh, first of all, movement. If you're doing a lot of movement in front of a hive uh, or a natural colony, then they will respond to that stimulus by stinging. Uh, dark colors, like what I have on right now, uh, these dark colors will stimulate bees to sting, especially if they're moving back and forth in front of a hive. Um, alarm pheromone. So when, when a bee stings you, she deposits her stinger, and along with the stinger gets deposited on your skin a chemical. It smells a lot like bananas. It's, it's a chemical that is a pheromone that then releases defensive behavior in the bees. They will then orient to where that chemical is, and they will come in, and you will receive more stings from them. Another stimulus is breath. Your, your breath has carbon dioxide. It has other odors in it. Those are stimulating to bees to sting. So don't go over to one of these colonies here and go down on your hands and knees and blow on the entrance. You're sure to get stung. Uh, and another uh, stimulus that uh, releases stinging behavior are vibrations. So if I went over there and I started beating on that hive with a, with a rock or a brick, uh, the bees would respond. They would fly out of the nest and, and respond to that uh, particular stimulus. Here's a demonstration of defensive behavior. I'm going to do everything that's wrong. That's me on the left. So I'm going to give them a vibratory stimulation. I'm going to rip the lid off, and they're going to see all the movement that's going on over them. These three patches uh, are leather patches. Red is, is perceived by the bees as, in the, say, as black or gray, depending upon how dark the, the, um, the, the color of the red is. But now we're giving them stimulation. The bees are stinging, so that gave more alarm pheromone was released. Um, and uh, we walked out of, the, out of the, the, the camera range. But now I'm going to do it in slow motion. You can really see how this intensifies. So the first bees have landed on the patches. A few of them have stung. Now alarm pheromone is being released. And now the intensity of the stinging on, on the patch is increasing. You see all these little dots everywhere. Those are stingers that were left behind. They're left behind and they're emptying their venom and their pheromone onto this leather patch. 
these streams that are, that are coming out from these, these are the intestines of the, of the worker. They're, they get eviscerated when they sting. Here's one that's trying to get away, and he's, she's um, trapped by her own, her own um, uh, entrails. Uh, but anyway, this is a, this is a very high uh, level of defensive behavior that this particular colony uh, is showing. They also have an internal police. Uh, it's the reproduction police. They are, they are on the lookout for worker bees that might be uh, laying eggs of their own. Now, workers do have ovaries. They're very reduced. And under certain conditions, they can lay eggs. Uh, sometimes, even when a queen is in a colony, a few, a few workers will cheat and try to lay eggs that are destined to become males, the male reproductives, because they're not mated, they can't produce females. Uh, but the workers will detect them. Uh, they will then act very aggressively towards them. They'll pull on them, tug on them, and they may sting them and drag them out of the nest. But they get punished for cheating. Uh, again, in the same way our society, we have police, and you get punished if you don't obey the law. The laws are there to make sure that everybody uh, is, is treated in a fair way. When a queen dies, the, the, the workers will try to raise a replacement queen for her. But they can only raise replacement queens from eggs that the queen that died has already laid. So there's only a, a short window of time that they can actually be successful to select a very, very young larva and feed it appropriately so that it will develop into a queen that will replace the one they lost. We call those queens emergency queens because they were produced to replace uh, queens that were lost unexpectedly. Um, so they only have a short window of time. There's only about, about a five or six day window after a queen dies that they can successfully initiate a, raising a new emergency queen. If they fail to do that, then the social system pretty much breaks down. They no longer have the inclusive fitness um, uh, component to, to, to reproduction. They're no longer able to have the reproduction that they get credit for. Uh, so they start laying their own eggs. They'll lay eggs that turn into males. But it's, it's chaos because they don't have, um, uh, they don't have the, whole, the social structure behind it. This slide right here, if you look in here, each of those cells has anywhere from five to 10 or 15 eggs laid in them. So they're in competition with each other. They're laying eggs in the same cells. Uh, when those eggs hatch, some, another individual comes along and eats the larva. Uh, and so they really don't have a lot of success uh, as a colony once they lose their queen. You'll also see a breakdown in their foraging behavior, their, their nursing behavior, uh, you have way too many egg layers, and so it's basically social anarchy when you lose the queen. Once they lose those inclusive benefits of having a, a queen there, a mother there, uh, or having a sister who has been raised to replace the mother and can produce females, the system becomes one that's anarchic. In the tip of South Africa, there's a region that has a very special population of honeybees. Uh, it's the same species, it's Apis mellifera, uh, that we use for the, as a European honeybee uh, that we use for commercial beekeeping in, in, in the US. But it's a special population down here that's evolved some very unique characteristics. This has come about as a consequence of the high rate of queen loss. Uh, when the winds blow constantly down here, and, and some of the winds are, for long periods of time, are above the, um, the flight ability of the queens and the drones, and queens that go out on a mating flight don't come back because they got blown somewhere and got lost. So a lot of colonies lose their queens. And over time, over you know, thousands of generations or whatever, um, the, the, the workers have, instead of, have, of laying eggs everywhere that become drones and having a, an, an, an anarchy kind of a social structure, 
um, they have evolved a very social parasitic trait. So when they lose their queen, if they can't replace her, then the, the workers uh, will abandon the, the, the colony, the nest. They'll abandon the nest, they fly out and they invade other nests that have functional queens and functional society. So theirs is no longer functional, they leave, they join a functional uh, colony, and then they start laying eggs, and the eggs that they lay are female. They develop into female uh, uh, offspring, and they do this by a kind of parthenogenesis called thalidiki. So you know, normally unfertilized eggs will develop into males. Well, with, and they're haploid, because they didn't have a sperm uh, fused with them. Well, under thalidiki, they lay an egg, and it can develop into a female because the egg will, will, will duplicate its genome and then develop as a normal female. So, so now all females, all the females in a nest, all the worker, so-called workers, they're now false queens, um, all of them have the same genome. They're clones, they're clones. They don't work. They basically, they, they produce themselves over and over and over inside of a colony. Eventually they will kill the queen that's in the colony and then the colony will produce a whole bunch of them, and then the colony will collapse and die, and all of their progeny, part of this clone, well, they'll, they'll spread out into other colonies and then contaminate them and kill them. So it's a, very, it's a very serious problem for beekeepers in that region of, of Africa, because up in here, they're not keeping the, the, the capensis bees. They, they're keeping uh, different, another subspecies of African bee that's a very viable commercial bee, but these come out of the, co out of the colonies here and then they spread through this population and they, they end up killing a lot of colonies. So the invading colonies are selfish, uncooperative, and they don't survive on uh, the invading clones. Stingless bees have come up, developed a system where, they're, where they can protect against being cheated. So the queen is this right here, is, is, is herded by the other workers over to a cell. The worker, a worker constructed this cell. It's open, uh, it's ready to have an egg laid in it. They go and they bring the queen over to the cell. She watches as they fill this cell up with food. Each bee that's sticking her head in is, is expelling from her brood food glands food for, for the, the developing lar the larva that will be in there. The queen inspects it, she just inspected it, it's not ready yet, she backs off. Others are coming in and they're, they're putting more food into it until it gets to the right height. Then this worker here, she just got on top of the cell, she laid an egg, you see the egg right there. She laid an egg in there, but now the queen is coming in and she's eating the egg. Then after she eats the egg, she will lay her egg. The egg that the worker laid is called a trophic egg. And I told you, sometimes in some stingless bees, uh, all the males are produced by workers. But this is a very ritualistic behavioral process that has evolved over time, uh, whereby this is the way they guarantee and secure that the, the individual, the female in this particular case, in this particular cell, uh, was produced by the queen and not by a worker. Every stage of it is observed by a group of workers that are standing around. Now the worker comes over and it starts to, to um, uh, seal the cell. She just goes around in a circle, will seal the cell up, and then everybody goes away. And they start another cell that when it's complete, they go find the queen again and they bring her up. So they evolve this, this ceremonial sequence that essentially guarantees that they are, are in control of the... Uh, the origin of the, male, the males and females in, in the nest. So in conclusion, societies have fundamental structural needs to succeed. Otherwise, they fail. So if they don't have certain features, they won't succeed. They, 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 we won't see those, those failing structures. This is true for insects and humans because we have the same natural will that must be controlled, including selfish interests associated with reproduction. Individuals that join groups forfeit some personal liberties 
in exchange for the same protections of the group. Groups that live together must have mechanisms with punishment consequences to keep individuals from cheating. Social groups that don't have these mechanisms fail. Evolution of insect societies takes place as a consequence of successful societies out surviving and reproducing those that don't. Their social contracts are written in their DNA. Therefore, it's not surprising that human and insect societies share many features. But how does this come about? We didn't get to that part, but it'll come later. 